Welcome. This is a quick tour of Acme, a text editor created by Rob Pike almost 20 years ago as part of Plan 9. Although Rob created Acme on Plan 9, Acme is now available on FreeBSD, Linux, OS X, and other Unix systems as part of Plan 9 from UserSpace. There is also a port of Acme to the Inferno operating system, which gives a way to run it on Windows. The video description has a link to a page with pointers to downloads and more information. For me, the distinguishing feature of Acme is that it works well alongside the surrounding system, instead of trying to be a complete environment all by itself. Acme doesn't enjoy nearly the popularity that editors like Emacs or VI do, but it has a small, dedicated following. When I had to switch to using Unix workstations again in the early 2000s, I missed Acme so much that I ported all the Plan 9 user programs to Unix to get it back. Acme creates an experience where text is a dynamic thing that can be executed and assigned arbitrary meanings where plugins written in any language at all can interact with Acme and control Windows. The result is that you can keep using the tools you have instead of having to learn a whole new system, but you can still customize them to fit well into Acme. In this screencast, I'm going to try to convey a feel of what it's like to use Acme. I'm going to start with the basics and build up to a short programming session at the end. One final note before the content. I sized the video to fit YouTube's large video playing mode exactly. If the screen text looks fuzzy, please switch to that mode. Because Acme was designed as part of Plan 9, it is a graphical program, not cursor-dressed, and it makes extensive use of the mouse. The screen you're looking at is a small Acme screen. It's sized to fit exactly into a YouTube 854x480 video box. Normally you'd use a larger display. I like to run Acme full screen, as you see in the video. On a laptop, I flip back and forth between Acme and a conventional desktop. When I'm at work, I use two monitors, with Acme on one and everything else on the other. Acme takes care of window layout for you, automatically choosing the location for each window and arranging them in columns. In this tour, Acme has just two columns. A larger screen can comfortably support three or four. Each column contains some number of windows. On the screen right now, the left column contains a single window showing a quick UI tour, and the right column contains two windows showing a directory and a shell session. Each window has two parts. The top line, or tag, set on a light blue background, shows the file name and some commands such as del and snarf. The body, set on a light yellow background, shows the window content. Each tag has a nearly square layout box to the left of the tag. The layout box fills dark blue when the window has been edited to indicate that you might want to save it. Each column also has a tag with some useful commands and a layout box of its own. Because Acme was created on Plan 9, its UI assumes you have a three-button mouse and a graphical display. There is no text-only mode or cursor addressing. Since you can't watch my hand use the mouse in a screencast, I've modified Acme to show the buttons that are currently held down above the mouse pointer. Acme refers to the left, middle, and right buttons as button 1, button 2, and button 3. The scroll bar to the left of the body is a bit non-standard, but much more powerful than most. When you have a window that cannot be shown all at once, like this silly sampler, The scroll bar darkens to represent the entire content, with a light box showing the fraction you're currently viewing. You can click in the bar with button 2 to move to a different part of the text. You can also click with button 1 to scroll up and button 3 to scroll down. The amount that these clicks scroll depends on where in the scroll bar you click. If you click just one line down from the top, each click scrolls by one line. If you click three quarters of the way down the window, each click scrolls by three quarters of a window. You can also use the mouse to manipulate the window by clicking in the layout box. Clicking button 1 expands the window in the column, nudging other windows away. Dragging button 1 repositions a window without moving others. Clicking button 2 makes a window as big as possible while leaving the other window tags visible. Clicking button 3 makes the window take over the entire column, hiding the other windows. Clicking one of the other buttons brings them back. When manipulating text with Acme, the three buttons have distinct roles. Button 1 is for selecting text. Button 2 is for executing commands. For example, I have been executing the slide plus command to advance to the next slide. 
Button 3 is for searching and loading. If I select the word button with button 3, Acme searches for the next instance of the word button and moves to it. In the directory window, if I select the file name sampler with button 3, Acme opens a new window for that file. I can then execute using button 2 the command del to close the window. I don't have to select the text so carefully when using buttons 2 or 3. Acme will expand an ordinary click into a selection of the given word, so I can just right click on button or on sampler and just middle click del. Acme also assigns some convenient meanings to combinations of buttons. If you select some text with button 1 but keep it held down, then clicking button 2 cuts that text. Clicking button 3 pastes over the text. Cut, paste. A frequent motion is to combine the two, selecting text with button 1, clicking button 2 to cut it, and clicking button 3 to paste it back before releasing button 1. That amounts to a copy. A less common chord is to select some text with button 2 for executing, but add button 1 to the chord. That executes the command with an argument. For example, we can execute the command echo with argument button. Let's look a little more in depth at executing text with button 2. We've seen that useful commands such as del are listed in the window tag, but the tags are just a nice place to scribble text that doesn't belong in the body. Text anywhere can be executed. For example, I can select the word cut here with button 1, and then click on it with button 2 to execute it. It cuts itself. Similarly, I can select something else, and then execute paste to paste what I cut. There's also a useful built-in command called edit that accepts the editing language used in the text editor SAM, which bears some resemblance to the language used by ed and said. If I execute edit comma s slash tag slash tag slash g, it applies the s command to the entire window body, denoted by comma. Acme would not be very powerful, though, if all the commands had to be provided by Acme itself. External programs can be invoked as commands, too, like we did with echo, similar to running them at a shell prompt. Executing date ex runs the date program and puts its output in a temporary window created to hold the output. When you run a command in a particular directory, the window for the output has a title named for a file plus errors in that directory. Although that's the name, the file does not exist on disk, it's just Acme's title for the window. In addition to running commands, we can pipe selected text through a command. For example, I can select the top few lines and then execute pipe rot 13 to pipe the text through the rot 13 program and replace the selection with that program's output. A command beginning with a greater than arrow instead of a pipe only writes the selection to the command. It does not read the result back into the selection. If I click greater spell, it pipes the selected text through spell, which tells me via the errors window that I've misspelled execute. Similarly, a command beginning with a less than arrow only reads the command output into the selection. The command runs with no input. Clicking on less than astro runs the astro program, which tells us what we can see in the sky when. Like I said earlier, it's more common to keep commands in the tag than in the window body. I have two tiny scripts of my own called A plus and A minus that indent and unindent text. When I'm working on a program, I often have both in the tag just waiting to help out. Now let's look a little more in depth at loading text with button 3. We've seen that we can search for literal text and open files, but in fact the syntax accepted here is quite rich. We saw before that loading a file or directory name opens that file or directory. If the file is followed by colon line number, Acme opens the file to that line. The next address is pretty advanced. It says to select the third line, but then the minus moves to the beginning of the line, and the plus number 8 moves forward 8 Unicode characters, which puts the cursor just inside the quoted string, thumped. In my local Acme settings, I have colon 3 colon 9 set up as a shorthand for the last address. That's the form you see in very precise error messages from some compilers these days.
Addresses don't have to be numbers either. They can be regular expression searches and closed in slashes. This next address opens hello.go, searches for the word funk at the beginning of the line, starts the selection there, and then ends it with the first closing brace at the beginning of a line. One common use of this rich address syntax is to create a kind of hyperlinking, even in text files like programs. For example, here's a comment I wrote some number of years ago in the Plan 9 kernel. The comment says that sysfile.sys sysunmount function might be useful to look at, and we can just by right-clicking on the text. Of course, as I mentioned, the basic form of the address syntax is the conventional file colon line number generated by Unix tools like compilers or grep. Let's run hello.go. The compiler tells us there's a syntax error at line 6. Clicking on the error takes us straight to the line, and we can see that there really is a new line in our string because we used the wrong closing quote. This works even if the file is not already open. The program g runs grep-n over all source files in a directory. Executing g main shows us the matches for main. Here we have two in hello.go and one in smiley smiley smiley.c. Perhaps I should point out explicitly here that Acme supports Unicode and UTF-8, and of course was one of the first editors to do so. If you're wondering what smiley smiley smiley.c is, here it is. I believe it was written by Dennis Ritchie. I think of Acme as an IDE done right. Wikipedia says that an IDE is a software application that provides comprehensive facilities to computer programmers for software development, and that one normally consists of a source code editor, build automation tools, a debugger, and sometimes even a compiler and interpreter. An IDE tries to do everything. Acme takes a different approach. It does provide the editor part, but it assumes you've already got all the other tools and just want to use them effectively. It lets Unix or Plan 9 provide the development environment, and only worries about integration. That is, it does not try to reinvent everything. It integrates the tools that are already on your system and helps you use them more effectively. It fits into the surrounding system, in this case Unix. That brings us to exactly how it interacts with other tools. Because Acme started on Plan 9, it presents to other programs as a file system. On Unix, Acme still serves the Plan 9 file protocol, but there are helper programs that will talk to it for you if your language cannot. The best helper program is Fuse, which lets you mount Acme directly into the kernel file tree, but Fuse is not a requirement. Let's look around a bit. Each window shows up as a subdirectory under mund acme. The index file gives a list of all the windows and their tags. This list is meant for processing by programs, not people, so it has a rigid format. We can see the fs window here. The first number gives the window ID 2. In that Windows directory, we can read the tag by reading the tag file, and we can read the body by reading the body file. We can even write to the body by writing to the file. We can run Unix tools like grep or spell, but we can also run programs that know about the Acme file system to good effect. We've been running one of them this whole time. The slide plus command is a little shell script I wrote a few years ago for giving talks using text file slides from within Acme. Let's look at it. It does two interesting things. First, it finds the name of the current window using dollar percent. Then it does some grubbing around to figure out what the next slide is. And then finally, it invokes the slide command to load it in the current window. The slide command is simpler and more interesting. It writes three control messages, just text strings, into the current window's control file to set the name shown in the tag, mark the file clean to clear the blue layout box, and then invoke get to reload the window content from its current file name. Every time we advance slides, these scripts are running. Another example is the Adict program. It's a dictionary for Acme. If I execute Adict Acme, it creates a new window showing me the definition of the word Acme. Inside the dictionary windows, button 3's load functionality has been defined to mean look up a word. So if we type computer in the tag, and then right click on it, we get a new window showing the definition for computer, one who computes. This is using the Project Gutenberg Webster's dictionary which dates from 1913, so it's not quite up to date with modern usage, but it's freely available for you to install on your machine. Adict is a shell script. 
It's a pretty long shell script. We won't go through it in detail. But the important part is that it reads events like mouse clicks from the Windows events file and then invokes the event function here to respond to each click or event. The ML events indicate a mouse-driven load event. In response, the script creates a new dictionary window showing the definition of the loaded word. The program win that I've been running over here to show you the file system is not an ACME built-in. It is an external command like adict, although it is a C program, not a shell script. It starts a new window and a new shell and cross-connects them. Every time you complete a line in the window, it sends that line to the shell. Every time the shell prints something, it adds that line to the window. It's a terminal program in some sense, but it's really just a shell session synced with an ACME window. Because it's an ACME window, you can of course go back and edit anything. Until you hit enter, you can even edit the current input line. You can also edit all the history to cut out unnecessary pieces or mark things that look interesting. When I'm debugging low-level problems in the Go runtime, I often run GDB in a win window and then end up typing my own notes all over the GDB output as I work through a tough debugging session. Win redefines the middle click execution to mean send that to the shell. The common idiom is then to edit a command line you typed earlier and re-execute it. I worked for many years in a shell without history or command line editing, and I never missed it because Acme is providing this for me. Over the years, people have written many interesting Acme client programs, including a mail reader, a debugger, chat and IRC clients, and a music player. And you can write them in any language, shell script, C, Go, Python, whatever you like, maybe even Elisp if you're into that kind of thing. Button 2 isn't the only one with some deep tricks. Button 3 can do some fun things too. We saw that you can load files or directories with a rich addressing to specify parts of the file you care about. Button 3 can also synthesize new window content. For example, if you right click on Acme 1 here, it brings up a new window with Acme's man page. At the bottom of that man page is a reference to another page, Acme 4 describing the file system. Want to read it? Right click. Or, here's a file containing the output of a mercurial command showing some commits that affected the yak program. Want to see a particular commit? Right click on the hash. Or, here's a UPS shipment I was expecting. Want to see the status? You get the idea. The result of a load doesn't have to be a new Acme window either. In this demo directory, I have a few PDF files. Want to view one? Right click. Or here's a URL. What's there? The loading here is done by a separate program called the plumber. The plumber is controlled by a rule file, Munt Plum Rules, that contains patterns to match against button 3 text. This rule says that if the text ends in .pdf and names an existing file, it should be passed to the Plan 9 page program, which is the simple PostScript and PDF viewer you saw. Similarly, if the text begins with HTTP or otherwise looks like a URL, it should be handed to the web browser. The rules are yours to write. On Plan 9, when programs crashed, the kernel left the processes around like Unix zombies for debugging instead of writing core files. When your program crashed then, the shell would show the reason and the process ID, not core dumped. I used to use a plumbing rule that when I right-clicked on a number corresponding to a process, it would start a new window with the debugger running attached to that process. I also had a rule that when I right-clicked on a phone number, would turn on the speakerphone on my desk and dial that number. The nicest thing about this is that the link logic is separate from the text formatting. In web pages, the author of the page has to decide how to interpret the text and where the links are and where they should go. In the plumbing rules, you control how pre-existing unlinked text gets reinterpreted. Let's go through a simple example of using Acme to write some programs. Let's see if we can fix Go issue 3942. What was that again? Oh, right. JSON is reading one byte at the end of the array, which makes it block reading network data that isn't coming. I feel like I've fixed this before, actually. Let's look at this program. Let's copy this and turn it into a test to do some test-driven development.
This is about streaming, so let's put it in streamtest.go. I'm going to start a new Acme program called Watch. It watches the current directory, and each time something changes in the directory, it reruns the command given to it as an argument. It maintains the current output in a separate window. Here, I'm going to watch the output of running the short test suite for this package. Right now, it passes. That's good. Let's add our test. Whoops, compiler errors. Looks like I need to say import net. And since we're already in the JSON package, we don't need that. And now we have our deadlock. Here we can see that JSON decoder read value has called a read method. We think it shouldn't be reading that far, so let's look at the context of this read call and see why it started the call. I'm really surprised that this is reading too far. I really thought I fixed this. Aha! I did fix this, but I only fixed it for JSON objects, which use curly braces. JSON arrays, which use square brackets, still read too far. So we need to treat arrays like objects. Let's see what this scan end object is. Hmm, this looks like the definition. Yes, and thankfully there's already a scan end array, so let's just treat that the same way. And we're done. All right, bug fixed. So that's Acme. It's a text-driven programming system. It only supports text, no graphics at all. I like to think of it as an integrating development environment because it integrates the separate pieces you already have in your current development environment. You can extend and customize Acme by writing programs that interact with it or that manage windows or by writing plumbing rules to redefine what loading means. And you can write the extensions in any language you want. We saw a dictionary written in a shell script, a terminal window written in C, and the watch program written in Go. I've been using Acme as my day-to-day -day work environment for over a decade now. I've found it to be an incredibly productive way to work. If you want to try it out, visit my blog post at the link on the screen and in the video description. Thanks for watching.